You n most artists never get to see their work like this, where they can study it for any length of time. When I walked through the door yesterday, because I asked for a half an hour by myself to see the show with no one talking at me so I could think, I said, oh, Crow. I talked to myself, Crow, this is a really strong show. You're not too bad. That's what I said to myself. I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. I just, I mean, I, I mean, I'm looking at myself. These walls are who I am. So I'm sorry if I start crying, but when I saw those three, I love these three pieces over here, and oh my gosh, the rhythm in them, that's my rhythm. And I, it, there it is. So um, I want to start out with the very first one, and I want to tell you nothing comes easy. I'm sure you've heard this from many artists. This is not easy. Yeah, it's a quilt. It's like quilts, easy stuff. Anybody can do quilts. This is not easy. This is like painting. This is about line. This is about shape. This is about relationships. This is about proportions. And then what do they mean to you? And where are they coming from you? And why? So when I started, I had some leftover strippy seam in my studio. And strippy seam, for of you who do not know, is a matter of taking a piece of fabric, in my case, cutting it from selvage to selvage with a very sharp blade. And I pick this thing up into the air, and it's 44 inches long, and I look at it. And I think, I'm holding a line. I'm holding a line. Or I'm holding a shape. Well, I had made some small fabrics. I thought, Crow, you haven't been in here for a year. I don't remember anymore, frankly, how long it had been. You gotta do something. You can't just come in here and beat yourself up because you haven't made anything for a year. So I started cutting and going across. And I made this little study here. Now this little study, which looks so simplistic, this wasn't the first one. I made many before I made this one, and I said, bingo, good, this is good, this is good. You can, you can start here. So I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, but it's still not telling me, it's not giving me the direction yet. It's not going there yet. And many of you who know my life story know that I, I have this tug going on inside myself, which is symmetrical, asymmetrical, symmetrical, asymmetrical. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna go really asymmetrical. And I'm working on this thing, this piece over here. I'm thinking, wow, what a mess. I don't understand anything. It just looks like a bunch of stuff stuck together. And I thought, well, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. You just keep working. And bingo, down in the left corner, you see a black and white surrounded by a kind of beautiful blue-gray that I dyed. Okay, now this, I had this piece on my wall when I actually finally finished it and had it quilted and I kept it on my wall in my studio because I hadn't gone further with it. I'd done that small one, then this one, and I had let go of it in staring at this this last year, I realized here was another new sequence. It's a vertical sequence from here to here that means something to me. I can't tell you what it means. It means something to me. It's important to me. And this sequence then informs those three pieces there. So I'm talking about these one, two, three. All right, so now I've let go of that piece, and I'm thinking, keep working, keep working, and bingo, out came the tracks. I grew up in an era where, uh, bless my mother, she just always believed in daydreaming. I don't know how many of you kids, you got, I'm kids, you're not kids, got in trouble for daydreaming. I was always in trouble for daydreaming in, in school. But my mother actually encouraged it. So. She would tell me, just get out of the house and don't come back for four hours because she needed some time to herself. So off I would go, and then she'd say, and don't go near the railroad tracks. And she'd scare the living daylights out of me because the railroad tracks were right down the street from us. 
And there was the big X, you know, that like the death go over there and you're going to get killed. So all of a sudden I thought, my gosh, those are the railroad tracks. And the heavier shape pieces are the edges of the railroad tracks. And I'll use half of the railroad sign. Bingo. So this became a sequence that's actually horizontal, where that one's vertical. And that then was the beginning of this whole entire big series in here. And as soon as I hit this, as soon as I started this, I, got, I was totally centered. I knew I was home. I knew I was where I needed to be with the sequencing. Again, uh, many people know that I'm classically trained. I have a Master of Fine Arts in um, pottery and weaving, tapestry weaving. But I had to go through all the classical training, drawing for two years, design for two years, all the things you had to do when you were classically trained. And I also draw, taught drawing when I was in graduate school. So I love drawing. And I, I, at the beginning of my career as a quilt maker, you know, it's, I'm, I never understood at the beginning that it was drawing because I bought into the quilt making is only template making. You know, you have a template and you cut out a shape. It didn't occur to me that it's actually all about drawing, especially because you're using a cutter. And you're, you're using your cutter like you learn to draw. You draw from the top towards you. You're going like this through the air. So I start to make my fabrics. I call those new brand new fabrics vocabulary. So in other words, I don't go to the store and buy the fabrics that are going to make this quilt. I have to create those fabrics using the technique of strip piecing. And that means now not only am I going to be aware of cutting line and I'm going to be cutting shape, but what is the relationship between each line and each shape and what is the ground doing? So now everything comes into play. I chose to work in a palette of neutrals that I had dyed. I wanted all these exquisite, to use all these exquisite grays and gray browns and gray blues that I had dyed over the years that I had just sat there in piles. So um, the very first one, I wasn't aware yet, very fine. The tracks are very fine. They're very narrow. So what I mean by that, these are lines. This is very fine work. And I made up these components. I had piles of these components. And I had to pin them all the way around the walls of my studio to find ones that I felt would work together before I put this entire thing together. And then I'm thinking to myself as I stared at this when I came in yesterday, gosh, sometimes I put the shape here, sometimes I put the shape over there. Can you see that? I don't know why I did that, but I did it. And I thought I'm going to keep it very severe. This is very severe. This is very classical. Done. So then I went on to the next one based on the little study up there. And I made brand new fabric vocabulary for this one, upping the scale just a bit, inserting the diagonals. Um, and you can see the rails going across the tracks, how they jut into these areas, depending on the value, if the, you can see them a little bit. Here they sink in. You don't see them. Here you can see them. Uh, some here you really can see them because they're going on top of black. So those are the, what goes across the railroad tracks. Then when I got to this one, I thought, wow, how come I have to do the same colors everywhere? I don't have to do the same colors everywhere. I can do what I want. I don't, the railroad tracks don't have to be red and black, I mean black and gray anymore. They can be all these colors that I want them to be. And the rails really start to show up going that way. 
And um, someone said something to me about why this is poking through on the edges unevenly. It's because I needed to pop out the railroad track. Then I scaled up even larger for this piece here to the right. And you'll notice that I like a vertical format. I think as an artist, if you're serious and you work long enough, you will start to understand there are formats that are all who you are. A vertical format is definitely part of who I am. Um, at, uh, this one I chose to add in extra additional black so the rails stop. You know, you have that black in there. I designed the quilting pattern, which is an undulating grid. I drew it out and my quilter fed it into her computer. And then um, I thought, whoa, I got to get into color. I got to get into color. I got to get into color. I'm going to scale everything up even bigger. So these linear ele elements here, the, si the main tracks of the railroad tracks, and the two edges that are actually here and here, but I put them there because I felt like it. They are no longer lines. They're now narrow shape strips. And I thought I'm not using black. I'm going to use a palette of colors for all that you see that I used here. I have twice as many I did not use, but I went ahead and made them. They're there. I could use them again sometime but these were the ones that worked. And then I went back to cobalt blue and black because I love cobalt blue and black. Scaled up even bigger. Actually took all the fabrics with me to New Zealand when I was teaching. And in the classroom while the students were working, I was busy making the voca fabric vocabulary. Um, by this time, you know, you know, I told you how long I stumbled with these two first pieces to find my footing. By this time, I have my footing. I have more ideas than I know what to do with. I can't even begin to make all the work. So this just flowed. Bing, 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 done. And I cut it and did reversals. What I discovered when it was all done, it looks like lace. And then I thought, now I really have to go into color. And now I've got to get into more curving strips. Well, that was dumb. <laughs> this was so hard to make, I cannot tell you. I thought I was, you know, I got thick hair, but I tell you, I think I had bald spaces on my head. I, there was a day I literally thought I'm going to go out and throw this thing in the burn barrel because it just couldn't get resolved. I couldn't fix all the places that wouldn't lay flat, and then I just had to get out of my studio and go do something else because I was getting myself so stressed. But um, new things I discovered. Remember how I commented about the side where the rails go over? Look what I discovered. Oh my gosh, the curving is forming a whole brand new shape under here on the sides. Huge discovery. I haven't even begun to explore what I could do with that. Just that small thing forming these brand new things, which really shows up in this one, what they did. I love how it squeezes that together. These little sides, see the browns, what it's doing in the turquoise as it goes up? It was just like a huge discovery. I couldn't have done that just because I wanted to intellectually. It was a discovery and I feel like I've got drawings at home of what I can do with it and how I can play with it and how we can form great big secondary shapes. And that's how I think art is. It's discovery, discovery, discovery. And I have to stay in place and make the work in order to make the discoveries. I can't sit there and intellectualize it. It doesn't work. This one also has those great shapes on the thing, but this is a little bit of a fat ball. You see that? This one's elegant. And this is a little fatty. <laughs> the other group that I have here is called seeking. That's the main uh, key word. And that is these two pieces over here. I actually have more pieces in this group, but I, they're not here. But the key thing is seeking. 
So if I'm in this mood to work on seeking, seeking colon, then the second word that comes after will be whatever that sensibility was I was trying to capture. So in the first one, it is seeking cola calmness. This is calm because pan, blue, pink, white and black, it's a very quiet piece. And I designed these undulating vertical strips, lint all over it, um, very close, one eighth inch to a scant one fourth inch. Again, she fed it into the computer. So you can do a drawing that looks like it's hand drawn and you can feed it into the computer on the quoting machine and it comes back out looking like it's been hand done. And then I did energy, seeking, colon, energy. And maybe to your eye, whoa, easy. I cannot tell you every placement, every placement, some, some of them took me a day and a half because I would insert it like this one here, sewing it in. Then I would lay the next one there and I have to say, is this the relationship or not? Is this right? Should this be pushed way over here? Should it stay there? Because I have no diagrams before I'm working, I don't know, I have to discover it. And again, even these major players, these major figures, I had stacks of them. Just to cut a figure like this that I liked before I put on the strip pieced edges, stacks of them. I'm so critical. Pin them up on the wall. No, all of those are ugly, Crow. Take them down. Cut again. You go through yards and yards and yards of fabric. You have to do that. I have to do that. And I chose three colors for the ground, as you probably see. Up here, these are all glowing versions. And down here, these are what we call flat versions so that I wanted to see what happens when I use glowing colors in the figures. What do they do when they're on a glowing ground? What do they do when they're on a flat ground? And then over here on the sidewall are two pieces from my drawing series. And you know, I had this idea, okay, Crow, strip piecing is intense work. Why don't you do something simple? And that means just cut horizontal lines and insert them. But you see, not so simple because we're back to every single placement had to have thought, time, and experience, just like that major piece. So it took a long time to make this piece. Even every one of these cuts I had to look at it and, and say, you're in or you're out. And then when I got to this big piece, after having done this one, which is straighter, I thought I've got to start cutting, I want to start cutting things that are odder. And I, I, I just have to think about every single one of these grounds, are they going to be good enough? So. Color palette, pretty simple, but I kept using the operative word obtuse. I want these odd colors. Uh, the actual section I had started with was here. Why? Because red and blue are two of my favorite colors. So I can be relaxed. So I started here and I thought, okay, Crow, gotta whip it up here, gotta whip it up, whip it up. And then I thought, gotta scale it up. So I scaled it up. And then I thought, I got another, I got to bring in that odd gray pink or mauve. And then I've got to hit it with orange down here. And these have to be totally different shape. 
And then the last piece is clickety-clack. So that's the energy of the train wheels going down the railroad. And I will be honest with you, it's the first one. It's flawed because it is a perfect example of me in conflict with myself because now I'm back to the symmetrical person fighting with the asymmetrical person and not allowing either to exist. And it is total turmoil. It's crushing because I want the spontaneous me to be the one who wins. And they, it can't win. I can't allow it to win. And I can't, I can't tell you why. But I do know if I go on with that, eventually that side will come. And from all my reading, the spontaneous side, the improvisational side, many people believe is the true soul, the true artist, the true, true artist, no matter what the medium, that you have actually touched your soul. So when you're in that conflict, you don't know if you're afraid to find out who you are, whether you can do it, whether you can discover yourself, whether you're capable. You see, I never care what people think about my work. And I don't mean that to sound egotistical, but if I did, it would destroy me. I couldn't make my work. Now, that's not the same thing as a teacher giving critiques. I'm talking about I can't make work for other people. I make it for myself. And that's so important to me. If nothing else before I die, to know that I have tried my best. Thank you.